Today I'm trying something new. I'm still trying to figure out the style of video for revamping this channel. I always ask myself, what do I want people to take away from this video? I recently decided that I want to help everybody with commercial patterns by going over them, reviewing them, and giving them a grade in the end because I can never escape the eight years of my undergrad and graduate degree. Just a disclaimer, I am in no way a professional seamstress. Her sewing is just a hobby that I am very passionate about. I took one theater costuming class in my early years of college and then just kind of self-taught myself. Therefore, I cannot guarantee if this video of reviewing the pattern we're gonna go over is going to make the process of trying to understand a commercial pattern less confusing. But I am hoping that this video and future videos will be helpful in helping you navigate the jungle map that is a commercial pattern sometimes. I will be going over Simplicity's S8857, or Mrs. Apron, which I find slightly sexist. If you identify as male, but you like this pinup styled apron, you do you and make and wear this apron. Also, something I don't want beginner sewers to sweat is that just because the brand is Simplicity, you're confused and not understanding it, this is not uncommon. Commercial patterns can be hard to understand and even a seasoned seamstress who's been doing this for 10 years like me gets confused with commercial patterns as you will see. That just makes me want to rip this pattern to shreds and burn it in the fires of hell. Anyways, I will be making apron C. Just note that this pattern does not have the petticoat that is underneath this apron in the picture. That is a separate pattern and I will eventually make a pinup petticoat for this series. Fabric suggestions for this pattern are broadcloth, sheets, Eyelet, cotton types, 100% or blends, gingham, linen types, piku, piqui, quick. I'm not sure how to say that. Or sateen. I will go a little more into detail when I get into cutting out the fabric, but I learned the hard way that when it comes to the design of the fabric for this pattern, it is best to go with a tossed layout which is also known as a random layout, meaning the prints are in many different directions and it does not matter which way you cut them. I'll leave a great link I found that helps my understanding of fabric designs. One thing I always forget is that certain patterns require particular fabric design. I will be using this cute plastic monsters fabric that I have been obsessed with since I was a teenager and was one of the first fabrics I purchased with my big girl adult money back when I was 18. This fabric is slightly hard to come by and expensive. I'll link where I bought this fabric this time around, but I do not know how often the shop resupplies. I will also be using this red broadcloth fabric for the front band. Her apron C, it also says you can use buttons, so I will attempt to use these cute Halloween buttons I picked up at Joann's for half off. There is some language in the pattern that beginning sewers might be unfamiliar with, and that is stay stitch, facing, base stitch, and slip stitch. And we'll be going over all of them during this video. I will also be providing links to videos I found helpful during this process. Now it's time to move on to my least favorite part of sewing because of my back problems, cutting out the pattern pieces with the fabric. All patterns give you a guide of which pieces belong to which garment. Look at that first and mark which pieces you will need for the garment you want to make. We will be going over apron C, which means I need the pieces four, five, seven, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. Finding those pieces and only cutting out those of the tissue pattern will save time and will prevent mistakes like cutting out the wrong pieces for the wrong garment, ruining pretty fabric because I've never done that before. So cutting the fabric is where I ran into problems. So this monster fabric design is a turnover one direction layout that is 44 inches wide, which means cutting a rounded skirt became hard. An important thing to watch for with patterns is that pieces tell you which direction to cut the grain, how many to cut, and if you need to cut on the fold. 
the skirt is a cut on the fold. However, because the design of the fabric only faces one way, I could not cut on the fold in the larger size I need. I'm a more curvier woman without the design of the fabric being upside down because it was not long enough. This means I'm going to have to make a seam in the middle, which I'm hoping is not too distracting because the pattern is so busy. Another issue I ran into that was not long enough for the tie end. So I had to Frankenstein that together, which I think is an appropriate term because well, you know. I needed to make sure to lay it out so I had seam allowance for the patchwork. Make sure to check off every piece that is needed. I noticed I forgot my front band because it fell on the floor and cut that out. After I was finished, my camera died. This was the perfect time for me to take a break, rest my back, and enjoy my Starbucks tea. After changing into a more comfortable outfit for sewing, first I need to sew together those extra Frankenstein seams on the skirt and tie ends. And now it's time to look at the dreaded pattern directions. I'm only kidding. Only one part is kind of sort of hard. Be aware that the directions for apron B and C start on sheet two of the directions all the way in the bottom left corner. And here we see a classic issue with commercial patterns. They have more than one stage of sewing the garment in one step. This is where a lot of people, including myself, get confused. I know they do this to save paper, but my dyslexic brain take the directions one sentence at a time, try to match as best as you can with the picture provided and follow the suggested seam allowance that is in the general direction section. First, it says to do a stay stitch. It's a basic stitch that goes across your fabric where the directions indicate, but it does not sew anything together, but rather holds the fabric in place. Some people may think it is unnecessary, but I have learned that it really does help shape the lasting effects of your garment. After sewing the stay stitch, stitch together bodice front, piece nine in the middle with pieces 10 on the sides of it and size 11 sewn onto 10 to create this cute pin-up bodice shape. Make sure to face the front bodice seams to the middle and press, and then open up the side seams and press them to make them flat. Speaking of face, here we come across another term that some might be unfamiliar with, facing. Facing for this garment is a little different than what most patterns present. It is the same exact bodice piece. Facing is usually a small piece of fabric that runs along the neckline to create a finished edge. In this case, the facing seems to be acting more as lining for the bodice because it is the same exact piece. However, lining is usually a different type of fabric from the main fabric, and facing is usually the same fabric as the main. So I believe that is why they're calling it facing. After making and pressing the second bodice, mark which one you will use for front and which one you will use for facing, and put the facing off to the side for a couple of steps. Next, it's time to make the front band and neck strap. Directions do not require pressing both pieces, but I always do to make it easier when I'm sewing and turning them out. Because the band is a solid bread, it does not matter which way I press it, but I make sure to press the neck strap together right side to right side. After I stitch the sides of the front band, which by the way, I know I should have switched to red thread, but I was too lazy to switch out my thread for four small stitches just to switch back to black. Try not to be lazy like me. I stitched the bottom of the neckband. After I turn out the front band, I make sure to press it. However, turning out the neck strap to the right side will be a little harder. I'm going to show you a sewing hack I learned in my theater costuming class. Take a safety pin, pin it to one side, making sure the metal chunk on top will turn into the hole of the piece. Then turn the safety pin into the hole and maneuver it through the fabric. You'll be able to feel where the safety pin is inside and make sure to help turn the fabric inward on the end as you go. Eventually pull all the way through and make sure to press because this process makes the shape a little wonky. I pin the band to the top of my bodice front and then the neck piece following the directions and the picture example to where they should be placed. Just to note, I did switch up steps 18 through 21 because I wanted to press, stitch, turn out, and baste all at the same time because it seemed more efficient in my brain. Take these steps however you feel is necessary. So a base stitch is not hard. It's just a basic hand stitch that temporarily holds the fabric together and in place. Take a hand sewing needle, thread it, tie the two tails together, and stitch it straight through, being sure to use thread that is a different color from your fabric so you can see it when you need to remove it later. Some might think, can I not just pin it? Well, yes, but it makes the process a little more complicated when removing the pins to put the facing on it right sides together. The band and straps could fall out of place if they are not basted together. This step just temporarily secures the pieces of fabric into place. By the way, I hate patterns that never tell you when it's safe to remove the base stitch. So after you permanently stitch the bodice pieces together, turn it right side out and you can remove the base stitch.
Then create a new base stitch on the bottom of the garment to temporarily keep it in place. Putting it aside for a while to work on the skirt. Day stitch the top of the skirt and take out the midriff pieces. There are two pieces of the midriff front and four pieces of the midriff back. Take two midriff back, sew them to the sides of one midriff front. You make two of these for the midriff front and midriff facing. Congratulations, this was the easiest step of the next six. I'm not even a little joking. I got so confused at this point trying to follow these directions because of my dyslexic brain. So let's just get into it. First, clip out small triangle-like shapes in the upper part of your skirt, just above the stay stitch. This helps the fabric naturally flow with the curve of the waist when it is finished. The directions do not say how far apart the clip should be, so I went an inch give or take. And don't worry, with this measurement, I was able to jump over the Frankenstein scene I had to make in the beginning of the skirt. After clipping, stitch the midriff to the top of the skirt with the regular seam allowance. Then you move on to stitching together the tie end pieces. Once again, press them together and stitch the bottom. The directions say to sew the edge of the strap, but I did not do that because it would have made turning it right side out so much harder and I'm impatient sometimes. So I left the ends open so I could do that sewing hack I showed everyone earlier. So after that, I folded the ends inward, pinned and pressed the fold in the rest of the tie in, sewed the ends and base stitched them to the midriff. Grab the bodice, then pin the bottom of it to the top of the midriff. Take out that temporary base stitch to only once again base it, but this time going from the sides to the top of the midriff with the right sides of the skirt and the bodice put together. Once again, it was probably because of my learning disability, but step 30 was where I was confused with the directions the most. The example picture was not the top I made, and these directions were not written in a clear matter to me. They read, with right sides together, pin facing to midriff, over the bodice and tie ends, and band neck strap B and C. My brain does not work like this, and for me, the language would have made more sense if it was ordered like this. With right sides together of bodice, with midriff front and midriff facing pinned together. Once I finally figured out what the directions wanted, thanks to this tiny little corner of the photo example, I pinned the midriff facing and the midriff front with right sides together and stitched it together. Then immediately had to rip out the side seams because I was so frustrated with the confusing directions that I forgot to move the tie ends so that they were facing inward and could be turned out correctly. Make sure to step away from your projects when things get confusing and frustrating so that your brain has a chance to cool off. After I fixed that mistake, I trimmed some seams so it would lay flatter, flipped it right side out, folded the edge of the midriff that was not sewn in, and pressed it to make the slip stitch easier. This is the moment where all machine sewing for the garment should be done and over with, but if you did not notice, all the way back in step 24 for when you had to stay stitch the skirt, I forgot to hem the skirt and did not notice for a couple more steps. I really hope other people make these mistakes when working with commercial patterns. Anyways, now it is time for some hand sewing. Slip stitch the folded midriff facing to the top of the skirt. A slip stitch is quite simple. After threading the needle and tying the two tails, start from the wrong side of the fold and pull through until the tie end of the knot hits the fabric. Go to the other side, the skirt, and grab a little as fabric as possible with the needle and pull through. Then go to the fold, Put the needle through the edge of the fold with as little fabric as possible again and pull through. Then go back to the other side, which is the skirt. Once again, grab as little fabric as possible and repeat. You do this over and over, careful to not accidentally create a knot. You should also be using thread that matches the fabric, but this pattern is so busy I decide to use the same color I was using as before, black. The directions say slip stitch pressed edge of facing over seam. However, I was not liking how the stitch was coming out, so I ripped that out and decided instead to use the seam as a guide and slip stitch by grabbing fabric behind the seam, and in the end it still ended up covering up the seam. I have to say, this was the first time I hand sewn in a really long time, and even though it took two hours to do, I found it very meditative relaxing and a good distraction with everything that is going on in America right now. This is also when my cat decided to make his cameo. 
He always wants to try and sit on my lap when I have something sharp in my hand. I don't know why he does this. Also, I have to apologize for how gross my nails look. With the recent virus numbers, I have not felt safe enough to go out and fix them. Anyways, after finishing the slip stitch, I turned it over and saw it actually worked out great. Yes, you can see some stitches in the lighter part of the design of the fabric, but I still think it came out good for someone who hardly ever hand sews. This is also when I realized I should have done the hem way back when I did the stay stitching for the skirt. So I had to do that now. So I pressed the hem. Usually I would recommend double folding the fabric just in case your fabric likes to fray, like this one annoyingly does. But I couldn't since I had already sewn the bodice on the skirt and I was not ripping out any seams after that two hour hand sewing session. But I did end up folding the bottom after I finished my first round of hem, pinning it and sewing it during my second round of hemming. That way I would at least not have any jaggling strings from the fray of the fabric. Now it is time to sew the buttons on. I picked out these three skull ones out of the Halloween buttons because they were the only three that looked the same. I realized after that they were different sizes. These are shank buttons. I'm not sure if that is really how you pronounce it, but it sounds like I'm about to go into the prison yard and stab someone with a button. Anyways, I measured out and marked where the buttons would be and used the pins to see how it would look. For a shank button, you would first pull through the thread from wrong side to right side and back around, creating a stitch that does not even have the button in it. Come back up to the right side, Put the needle through the button and stitch back to the wrong side. Do this around about three times and I'm putting a little tension in the end to make sure they are securely in place. Bring it back up to the right side and then wrap it around three times of the base of the button. Secure it in place. Careful not to catch any pins while you're doing this. Stitch back to the wrong side, then go under the stitches three times to help secure them, then create a knot by going back again under the stitches twice and clip your edges. After you do your two other buttons, you're done. And after clipping the stray straggler threads on your garment, it's time to try the garment on. Overall, I think this apron came out really well, and I'm very happy with the results. It fits best with a pinup dress because they have the same silhouette, but I think this apron is a perfect one who loves pinup styles like me, and I added my own dark horror loving twist to it. Despite my fight with the midriff facing and other mistakes I made, I think if you take your time and read these direction clearly and thoroughly, this will make a great project for beginning sewers. And because of this, overall, I would give this pattern an A-. minus For one, I understand simplicity wants to save paper, but I do think some steps need to be separated and have more clear coordinating pictures instead of having so many different stages shoved into one step. By the way, I am in no way talking crap about simplicity while making this a review. I really do love their patterns and the garments I have made from them. I just think commercial sewing patterns could be clearer. This project took me three days to complete. If you made this apron from this pattern, tell me what you think of it and how you think mine turned out. If you want to see more of these types of videos, subscribe to my channel. I'm Cheska Cat, and I'll catch you next time.